stole my heart when we met. You made me feel so alive. We could talk. Welcome, everyone. Yes, it is another episode of Listen to the Vibes, and I'm so privileged to be sitting here talking to Mr. Chris St. John. He is a wonderful human being. We've had such a great conversation before the show started, and I mean, we got a lot of stuff in common. Uh, unfortunately, he's stuck up in New York. We got to get him here to Texas. How are you doing, Mr. St. John? I'm, I'm doing well. I'm ready to come to Texas. Uh, <laughs> We had a good conversation. Well, I'm going to take you out for barbecue as soon as you get here. Okay, I'm coming. No, no better place in Texas. <laughs> but um, as I was telling you, you know, people would, they really want to, to know who I'm talking to. So tell us about where you're from, um, where you grew up, all the things that you've been doing all these years and how you got to where you're at right now. So. I'm going to leave it to you. I'll, I'll try to give you the Reader's Digest version. Uh, <laughs> I grew up in Bayport on Long Island to a, uh, you know, a modest uh, middle-income family. And I, I uh, worked a lot of jobs and paid my way through college and law school and um, got married, had a son. And in the interim, I had uh, done an inter internship in the State Department. I worked in, at the Reagan-Gorbachev Summit. I studied and taught in China for a semester. Um, I worked for a congressman for about four years. Um, and then I went back to law school and I opened my practice, hung out a shingle. And now we have uh, four attorneys and four staffers. And uh, so we've grown that business over the last 26 years. I, I was a judge for 12 years and a prosecutor for four, but I followed my passion um, and now I'm making music. And you, you're a man of many hats. Well, uh, I want to live life to the fullest. And uh, as we I talked you. before, you know, I had a, uh, at one point a near-death experience. And ever since then, I sort of felt like um, not afraid to, to go after anything. Well, what I like is when people just seem to reinvent themselves and, you know, try to make something out of their life to make – to make a better place, to make it interesting, just to do the things that you like to do. And you've been doing all these things and now you put out an album. Uh, I got to listen to it before the show. And I mean, you have a great voice. Thank you. The, the instrumentation, I, I just love. And I mean, how did you find out that you had this talent for one and to actually go for it? I was a music lover since I was five. I was hooked on the Beatles and I started writing songs at seven. Uh, I, I didn't write anything serious until I got a guitar at around 14. And, you know, I was self-taught. I always had a, a voice that um, was just an, just naturally sort of uh, soothing and, um, and also emotive. It, it sort of, um, I think it lets the listener know what I'm feeling inside. And um, that's a God-given uh, gift that that I yes. have. Yes. Uh, I wasn't classically trained to sing, um, and I I have a, the ability to to take the things I'm feeling and ex and the the events that are going through and to put them to a, a song, um, and that's the the real gift that I've been given um, to be able to, to to do that. This album is autobiographical. Um, it yeah. talks about you know the good times and the bad. Um, it talks about the death of my parents, uh, uh, DNA discovery that I uh, I came across is in one of the songs. My near death experience. It talks about um, you know loss and love. And even though parts of it might sound sorrowful, the chords that I chose and the message that I always end on is hope and perseverance. And I don't think I've written a sad song that doesn't end up there. And you, you got a Grateful Dead song on there too, right? Yeah, well, that's actually, I think it's an old Scottish traditional song, but uh, Jerry Garcia and the Grateful Dead made it quite famous. Um, I don't know why I decided to put that on the album. Um, we did a cover of Ripple and, you know, I, I yeah. think in order to in order to, to put out that on an album, I'd have to, have to go through hoops to, to talk to two estates. 
uh, Hunter and Garcia. So I put this traditional song on. I like the way I, that I could pick that song. I, I played that myself, the guitar on that. And, and I love the song. It tells a great story. And I love to sing it. So oh, it's beautiful. It on there. Yeah, it, it's beautiful. You did a great job on that. Um, I, I will say we both have a talent when it comes to music. You have a voice that will fill a room. I have a voice that will clear a room. <laughs> yeah, I'm, sure, I'm sure you've been saying a little bit. <laughs> um, in the shower, but that's about as far as my, my concert going goes. Okay. Uh, but, uh, you know, what I appreciate, appreciate about you is uh, – Number one, you're very charitable. Uh, number two, your your love of God, love of country, and it's it's nice to see somebody with the, with your faith and 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 your love that's making a difference in this world. Uh, I definitely want to hear about your charity, and yeah. uh, we will at, we will put that in the description on how to to give to the charity. So I'm gonna let you go. Well, let me let me just uh, tell you. The things that I, that I, the way that I am is not by accident. I had two of the best parents that any boy could ever ask for. Um, <clears throat> I fought in World War II and uh, taught me how to love my country and um, love God with my mother. Um, their names were Harold and Loretta. And so there came a point in time in my life where I wanted to give back to other kids and to the extreme poor. Uh, those without a chance. And I thought, well, I can't raise all these kids. And most of them were in Africa and then we've been to Central America and, and also to uh, Haiti. But um, what I wanted to give them was an opportunity, good health and an opportunity to get an education. So our first couple of trips um, were to Zambia where we would go out into the bush, we'd drive five hours in the middle of nowhere where all these kids lived alone. Um, with just a few village elders who survived the AIDS epidemic. And they would just come from miles around. We treated them for all kinds of maladies. And uh, we gave them dental care, the first dentist they'd ever seen. We, we tested them for malaria, treated them for malaria. Um, we, we expanded our efforts to, to bring some doctors from Argentina to do cataract surgeries for the older folks who couldn't see anymore, um, and a general uh, surgeon. Um, we uh, put in an irrigation system at one village for the cistern so they could grow their own crops. We just kept on thinking of new ideas on, on how we could help them. And so one of the things I think you'll find interesting is in, in Zambia and other countries, the kids are allowed to go to school. They have a public school, but they can't go without a school uniform. Mm -hmm. and they can't afford a school uniform. We bought thousands of school uniforms and handed them out to these kids so that they could go to school. So when I look back on my life, I think that I'll be most proud of the, of, of, of the fact that um, I did my best to help as many people as I could. And the, 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 the charity is named after my parents, Harold and Loretta, Halo Missions, H-A and L-O. Uh, it's at www.halomissions.org for anyone who's interested. Um, we've been to El Salvador uh, three or four times helping young, young people there in a, in a hospital um, and throughout the orf there's a number of orphanages that we've helped quite a bit. I, I, I was speaking to one of the ladies who ran one and um, so the kids didn't have milk so I just said well I had a, 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 an interpreter with me. I said, do you know a farmer? And he said, sure. I said, get him on the phone and ask him how much he'll sell us a cow for and a uh, milking cow. And he told me and I met his price. And the next day a cow was, was coming onto the property. And we've since given them some pigs and goats and chickens. Man. Okay, something else that I want to bring up because uh, there's something we both went through. Uh, substance abuse and getting getting past that and of course we got to talk about your horses man I know you're pa passionate about that so I'm gonna let you tell that story yeah, you know uh, when I was younger uh, one of the ways that I made money was being a bartender 
Mm -hmm. When you're a bartender, um, you you sort of pick up drinking. Um, it's part of the culture. Mm -hmm. uh, when I went to law school and became a lawyer, there was a lot of stresses, and I got to the point where I just had had enough, and um, gave it up. Um, I had a two-year-old at home, and um, I could never just have one. I'd say I'm going to have one tonight, and I'd go home and have three, four, or five, and I just said I'm not going to live life like this. So I prayed on it, and I went to some meetings and got sober. And um, it changed my life. I wrote a song about it on the album called I Called You Rose. I wrote it while we were recording the album. Most people think it's a love song, but it's, uh, it's about quitting drinking. I called you Rose. I called you gold. I called you whiskey. I called you my friend. You made me happy till you made me cry. I pray I'll never see you again. It's about booze. And um, so, yeah, that, 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 that was a big turning point in my life. I think I thank God for that. Um, the horse, the horse story. Uh, you know, during COVID, there was a time uh, I was in a bad frame of mind. I had laid off uh, seven employees and uh, you know, I kept their health coverage because I wanted them back. Um, but it was a tough time. And I, I told my wife, I need some time to clear my head. And, uh, so I, I went on a cattle roundup. I had found a love for horses out in Jackson Hole at one point. And I went on a cattle roundup to Bighorn Mountain. It was a, it was a real cattle roundup. Uh, and there were five of us, uh, 12 hours a day in the saddle, punching 650 cattle down Bighorn Mountain for six nights and uh, seven days. And um, the third horse I, I rode, I just fell in love with him. And I named him Reagan after President Reagan. And I brought him, I, I got a deal with the, with the rancher and I sent him home and he's just what, what the doctor ordered. I mean, if you're around horses and you love them, um, they are, they're very relaxing and they bring so, so much joy to your life. It was yeah. like, it's a gift, another gift that God gave me. Oh, I, I miss being able to ride horses. I used to do that when I was a kid and it was so much fun. But do you know, you were talking about rustling the, the cattle and all that um as a, as a kid in high school <clears throat> my uncle had a farm and we would go out there sometimes like during spring break and whatever and i mean my cousin and i we worked our tails off out there but that was some of the best times i ever had i don't know if it was just because you were accomplishing something you're getting your hands dirty you were out in the open it was just something about that. Yeah, it's all part of the package, but it starts with the horse. I mean, a horse is, is, is one of the greatest creatures on earth and uh, all different personalities. And when things are going right the way they should, you're, the rider and the horse are, are, at one, are one, one, one being and you're, in, you're connected. Um, you know, I came home, I wrote a, a song called I, I Need a Horse and I had it produced. And I, I love the way it came out. So I kept going and wrote the, I wrote the album. I had old songs I'd written, put it together. But without my horse, there'd be no album. So uh, kudos to Reagan. And, uh, you know, but I think that there's just, there's just nothing like a horse. My, I tell my wife I'm a cowboy. I've got some cowboy boots and a hat. She said, you're not a cowboy. You're from New York. And I said, look, I've been on a cattle roundup. I I I, uh, I own a horse and I've been thrown off a horse. I'm a cowboy, so uh, I'm I'm probably one of the few New York cowboys. But uh, I I'm, I believe I am. Oh well, you know maybe not in Long Island, but New York <laughs> they've got their their cattle ranches, they've got their farms they, and stuff. They do need, yeah, there is some beautiful land in certain parts of New York, but yeah, that's for sure. Everybody always associates New York City as being all of New York, and it's just not that way. No. no there's some beautiful places to substate. Oh, uh, yes. So, you planning on going on tour? Well, we've been climbing the charts. Uh, luckily, we, for I Called You Rose went to number three on the indie charts in Europe, and number eight worldwide. And second release, I'd send you my heart um, in two weeks shot from number 47 down to 11. So it um, seems like whatever we're putting out, people are, are responding to. 
We have a few country songs on the album we want to put out. And there are other singles as well. I think there's about six singles on the album out of 15 that, that I think you could consider singles. Um, we want to see where we get the most response and then go there to play. We have a band we put together. Um, we've been doing video um, performances, live performances of, our, of the songs that are on the album. And they're, they're going up one at a time on my webpage, www.chrisstjohn.com. Um, those are free to look at. You can buy my album or um, digitally or the, the real CD or any of the uh, shirts and hats that are up there and jackets. Um, but uh, it's, uh, it's been quite a ride. I think we'll tour when we know who wants to hear us the most, mm -hmm. where that is, whether it's Europe or somewhere else. And I can say I knew him when. <laughs> yeah. let's, uh, let's hope so. Well, I, you know, I'm comfortable wherever this takes me, to tell you the truth. Yeah. I mean, um, I've accomplished, uh, I've, I've, I've been able to do what I, I truly love, and that is, uh, that's a gift in and of itself. Wherever it goes from here, I'm, I'm quite happy with it. I mean, my own personal experience doing the podcast, even if there was just one person out there that listened to me, I, it, it still would make me feel good. I'm going to do this whether I'm successful or not. But when you're getting the success, let's put it this way. Whenever I have guests on that, you know, they've got some fame to them. Um, it's, it's exciting for me. And I get a, I get a kind of a rush out of it. Now, granted, I come down pretty quickly because, you know, <laughs> reality sets in, but when, when you're starting to get fame, like you do, what, what's that feeling like for, for you? I haven't really thought about that question. Um, I don't have people stopping me in the street quite yet, um, <laughs> but it's not fame I'm looking for. I want people to enjoy the the songs I've written. Mm -hmm. I want them to um, hopefully have it impact their life the same way music impacted my life growing up. I mean, you, know, you, you listen to a song and if it touches you, um, then that's all I'm really hoping for. Uh, fame is a double-edged sword, I'm not sure. You know, for some people it works quite well and for others that don't know how to handle it, it doesn't. But that's not what I'm looking for. I'm, I'm just looking to, to sing my music and, and write songs and see what happens. And in terms of your, your re, you reaching viewers, you know, I don't doubt that you'll be successful because you're very easy Thank to you. talk. Thank you. It's a nice give and take. And, and not, all, not all interviewers are, are, are good as, as good at it as you. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Well, one of the things I pride myself in is I see a lot of people try to go for that gotcha kind of thing when they're talking to people. And I don't believe in ambushing people like that. I want this to be one of those places you can go to and you can speak your mind, be yourself. And it should be enjoyable, not only for the viewers, but for whoever I'm talking to. So that's, that's, the direction that i'm going in but um i was going to tell you you remember starsky and hutch and uh i can't remember the guy's name that but uh one of them was a singer and when he started singing he wore a mask so nobody knew who he was <laughs> you may, or you could put on the makeup like kiss oh, no, <laughs> no. I, I, I um I play without a cowboy hat. I think it's uh, it's a little too much um, for me to pull off, but um, I do wear them when I'm riding. Um, you know, I do put on a bolo tie because I like it and uh, a pair of cowboy boots when I play. Um, we just have a we just have a lot of fun. The band we put together is a great group of people, very talented, and we all get along and. Um, and we 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 really make a tight union uh, in terms of the music that we we put out together, mm -hmm. and we like each other, which is really like uh, it's very important. Oh, very very yes. So what we do, need to do is get you a tractor supply cap, so you can wear that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I don't know. Do y'all have Tractor Supply Company up there in New York? We do. Yeah, we do. I love that place. I love that better than Walmart. Yeah, it's a, it's a great store. Uh, last time I was there, I had a long wait, but it's a great store. <laughs> so um, I was going to ask you, um, it, do you have like plans to, to go beyond the music, do something different? Or is this kind of what you want to, to do until you're just ready to retire? Well, you know, I became a firefighter at 49. I was mm -hmm. the old in my class by far. And what you mentioned before about reinventing yourself, I think that if you don't do that, you're really cheating yourself. We've only got such a short time here. And, you know, when you're 20, you think it's life's going to go on forever. Mm -hmm. And no, nobody that you love is going to leave the planet. Um, and as you get old, you start to realize all of a sudden life is... Is, is slipping by so, so so quickly and faster the older you get. I don't want to be cheated out of one minute. So I can't tell you what I'm going to be doing uh, a year or five years from now. I probably will be doing something unexpected. As I said to you in, in the pre-interview, the idea that someone, if someone told me I was going to own a horse uh, three years ago or two years ago, I'd say you're crazy. But um, I do, and I love them. Well. Look at Garth Brooks. He it was late in life when he got started, and boom, he was a superstar. And I mean, you you may be a, a, the next Garth Brooks. Well, we'll see. I, that'd be that would be a pleasant surprise. <laughs> so the next time I go to the pool hall, I'm gonna be hearing your songs on the jukebox. Yeah, I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of the things about the album, I think, is that it's quite diverse if you heard it. It's got a few sort of country sounding uh, songs on there, country and western. Um, it's got some psychedelic music. It's got uh, some pop, some soft rock. Um, you know, there's all kinds of instrumentations that I chose with my producer, Mike, um, from Young Street Studios. Mike Hogan who did a great job um in producing the album and you know i i said i want the second part of this one song to be very beatlesque and i uh, we chose together some really good sitar players and a, and a composer to do a, a score behind it and you know there's one musical score that i wanted to be written to connect two songs of, of similar meaning about my mother and um so we we, we talked to someone and uh he wrote uh, that score for us, and and it, and it came out. We didn't want to change a thing. I mean, it, it starts on the last chord of the song, and and it ends on the first chord of the next song. It's just a beautiful piece. Uh, I named it Pacific Sunrise because you, you can't help but listen to it and and just feel like you're you're right on the sea or, or watching. Well, you know, bands like the Beatles, the Who, the Rolling Stones, Led Zeppelin. All these guys, I think they stayed relevant for so long was because all their music didn't sound the same. They were always doing something different. Sometimes it sounded bluesy. Sometimes it sounded country. It, there's just so much diverse music when it comes to these bands that it kept it interesting. Whereas you have these other bands, they're, they were good, but they played the same kind of music all the time. And then it got, it just gets boring. Yeah, I, I wanted it to be a, an album where people who were listening to it didn't know what to expect next. So you don't have any idea what's coming next. And I think that we've accomplished that. A band that, uh, you know, you, you bring to my mind is the Grateful Dead. They, they wrote so many diverse and, mm -hmm. and different pieces of music from the, their early days when they were playing bluegrass and, and uh, they were playing acoustic sets uh, from American Beauty to Terrapin Station, where they were playing uh, such a different kind of music uh, than they had before. It was, they took a lot of chances. And uh, when you take chances, it usually pays off. And they had an audience that was very forgiving, thankfully for them. Uh, I was part of that audience. Um, and, uh, you know, you just waited for the big payoff. They could flub 10 songs in a row, but there was always a payoff at some point where the, everything connected in a way that, that you never you could hear anywhere else. Yeah, speaking of the Grateful Dead, I mean, they 
what kept them going was their audience because they didn't really have a big hit until a touch of gray came out and that was way into their careers you're right you're right it was right way into their careers and then in some ways it started to to draw people to the to the concerts that were looking for you know a band that was going to play a bunch of hits and they weren't really a part of the scene and, and they, they they sort of uh distracted from or detracted from uh from what was going on uh and there was some uh concerts that had to be canceled because of uh, violence and so forth people barging the gates and all during that time but um they made their mark that's for sure well i could say that would be one place where i'd say drink the kool-aid <laughs> <laughs> We're gone. <laughs> <laughs> You're definitely going to enjoy it when you drink the Kool-Aid. Yeah. <laughs> I could talk music all day. That's my passion. I mean, I can't play worth a darn. I, I'm not that great of a singer, but I still blare them out when I'm driving down the road, and I don't care who hears. Just something about music brings joy to your life, and it brings people together. It, I agree with that 100%. Um, it brings joy and it brings people together because there's a commonality there. It doesn't matter which, what, what uh, how political spectrum you come from. Music is something where everyone can meet in the middle and, and just enjoy, uh, enjoy what's being played. I mean, back to the Grateful Dead, I mean, you go to a show and there'd be a stockbroker on your left and and uh, someone selling hummus in the parking lot and traveling the country with the, with the band, and everyone loved each other. Yeah. And this put a missing from from our world and our country today. You know, I love to watch documentaries, and there was one that was talking about the the, the rock sound back in the fifties, and you had all these great players, you know, Chuck Berry, Little Richard, and I mean, just go on and on and on, but the best part of them i guess was the concert footage when they would show the auditorium and they would have that dividing rope down down the line and you had black folks on one side white folks on the other and then you'd see that that rope come down and everybody come together and was dancing together having a good time and we need that again you sure do i saw Smokey robinson in a small venue and it was it was a mixed crowd um black and white we were all having a good time with one another and there was no uh no animosity or, or, or no ill feeling we were just there to uh, celebrate together and uh, it was a great show i mean he's a prolific songwriter as you as you know yeah well nobody cared about your skin color when you were at a concert you just enjoy the music that's what brought people together i never really cared ever about it and i just never i i, I judge people for who they are it, it's amazing that power of music and the and the love that people can have together because of that commonality yeah i agree with you i agree with you 100 percent. dev we should stop having political rallies and more concerts oh that would be the answer <laughs> to all of our problems right <laughs> so it's like you know back in the in the 70s you mentioned you know music um, late 70s, early 80s, I, I can't remember the, the, the year, but when Pink Floyd came out with The Wall, I remember going to the theater and everybody's minds were just blown by that album and, and, and the, uh, the movie that came with it. Mm -hmm. music, music can, can, can really change the world. The Beatles show showed that uh, and so have other groups. Oh, yeah. I've got The Wall on DVD. I've got Tommy on DVD. Uh, Gosh, man, so many, I'll, I'll kind of Frank Zappa, like Baby Snakes and, and that kind of thing. And oh my God, I love those old, they're crazy, man. Those crazy movies. There's nothing I don't, no music that I really don't like uh, from my parents' time through, you know, the 80s. Uh, you know, I love the flatters and all, um, all the doo-wop and, um, you know, it was Elvis and all different kinds of bands, uh, Johnny Cash. Mm -hmm. Willie Nelson, all the greats. I mean, there were so many greats. Hank Williams. Um, oh, yeah. There's too many, too many different, tremendous artists. And um, I think it's really important to carry those songs with us. So 
you know, I try to slip in some of, of our um, of our sessions, some of these old songs, um, and and uh, when we go on tour, we, we won't just be playing my songs, although that'll be the focus. But I I want to I want to make sure that some of the great art that was created before me uh, doesn't die. So I would like to take that with me and play some songs that people would say, well, who wrote that? You know. I enjoy the jazz of like the 20s and the 30s. And then you get the. It's all great. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Then you got into the 40s and the 50s, that country music that came out of that time. And uh, who's your favorite country artist? Oh, she's. Uh, I mean, I love Patsy a bunch, Klein. but. Patsy Klein's hard to beat. Oh, yeah. For me, yeah. it's Buck Owens. He's my all time favorite. Yeah, I, I was in studying in China, and, and my, one of my one of my uh, roommates down the hall, he uh, he kept playing Patsy Cline's greatest hits, you know. And when I first heard it, I said, "What is that?" And then, like two weeks later, I, I was I said, "This is the best music I've ever heard in my life." And uh, I mean, she talk about someone who could bring you to what into her into her soul and to what she was feeling when she was singing. If there's anyone who's ever been able to do it, it's her. Oh, yeah. Well, Patsy Cline did it in her day. Janis Joplin did it in her day. Yeah, this, this man, there's this countless, but, you know, for me, uh, she, she, did, she, did a, she did a pretty good job. But I, I won't lie. For me, listening to those bands for the first time, your, your Hank Williams and, and Patsy Cline, I, I I liken that to when I first listened to the Beatles. These people just blew my mind. I, I appreciate my grandfather because he's the one that introduced me to that old country music. In fact, I've got I've got the the was it seventy eights and and some of the thirty threes that he left me after he passed away. And then my cousins who were a little bit older than me got me into bands like the Beatles and the Who and and Rolling Stones, Pink Floyd. And it just, man, it's just something about the music. I don't, know, I don't even know how to describe it. I'm, I'm at a loss of words when I talk about these bands because they're just so awesome. Well, I mean, there's countless uh, artists that have changed the world, and and I think that the the beautiful thing is when a song's been written that everyone can interpret in a different way, and then it can have a different meaning to them. And those songs take you back to times. I mean, if you hear a song that reminds you of when you were in high school or in middle school, or a song when you were a child and your parents were playing something on the phonograph, old music, I mean, really old music, you know, um, songs, uh, Come Back Nanny and Guess We Have No Bananas. I mean, these old, old songs, I, I heard them on this old, uh, a phonograph that my my great great grandmother had, and I just loved it all. I mean, "Hello Dolly" was I mean you know, um, there, there's just so many great songs to draw from. Oh, yeah, well, what brings me back to my childhood is uh, like John Denver and Jan and Dean. These were things that my mom listened to, and then my dad was into Bobby Vinton and Beach Boys and that, and so that always takes me back then. And then when I got into school, I, rem I always remember this. Every time I hear the song, Sultan's a Swing by Dire Straits, always takes me back to when I first started school. Well, that's what music does for you. I, I loved uh, John Denver. And, and I remember him, I was in China. And all around the school, they had speakers. And the only music they played day and night, all the time, all hours of the day was was John Denver over and over all of his music. They, for some reason, they loved him, and that's all they played. <laughs> <laughs> well, I could say I'd rather listen to that and some of the stuff I hear nowadays. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> but you know, even the Carpenters, man, that's another one that takes me back to my childhood. Beautiful music, bread, the Carpenters, that sort of uh, genre. Um, you know, you, you listen to You've Only Just Begun and it doesn't bring tears to your eyes. You're not, you don't have a heart. Mm -hmm. she, she was another one who could, uh, Karen could sing. Uh, she just made magic with her voice. Another thing I love about music 
is whatever mood I'm in, I can listen to all kinds of different stuff and it, it helps me. And it doesn't matter if it's the old country or if it's, you know, the classic rock. Sometimes I'm into, I just want to listen to hard rock or heavy metal. Sometimes it's the old doo-wop and, and the Motown and there's always something there. You got to leave your mind open. Sure do. Motown, another, another one uh, we, we, we didn't mention. I mean, just the incredible time in America. Um, and I think that was sort of a time when, when uh, music brought Americans together, really of all colors. And uh, we need more of that. We need more of it. Oh, yeah. So what do you usually sing when you're just driving around? Oh, I, I don't know. I, you know what? It's interesting. You know, a lot of the songs that I love and the ones that I play are sad songs. And my wife's always saying, why do you play sad songs? It's really make me happy. <laughs> and she's like, I don't understand. And, uh, you know, I said, well, I'm not alone in this regard, you know. Uh, this, and I, did, I looked it up online. And, and, and there, there are studies that show that sad songs do make people happy. I pointed that out to it. And Elton John said, they say, it said songs say so much, right? You were reading my mind. I was just about to say that. <laughs> well, I don't know. I, I mean, I, um, I guess I sing whatever's playing on the radio. God, my, my wife gets aggravated with me because every time we go on a road trip, I start playing Frankie Valley in the Four Seasons because I, I just love singing along to it. It's endless. It's endless. It goes on forever. The greats. That that's on my playlist. Little River Band. Uh, oh my God, I I could sit here and name stuff all day long. I won't get into that, but man, it just I, I even if I can't sing, and I tell people this, it doesn't matter if you can sing or not. If you feel like it, sing. I mean, you got nothing to lose. Exactly. Exactly. But. So what other interests do you have? Because we could talk about music, like I said, all day long. Um, I, I love to travel, travel quite extensively. And um, I think you grow and understand the world a lot better when you've been to a lot of places, mm -hmm. places um, Asia and, and Egypt and, and Turkey and, and in places of all different religions. I went to an Indian wedding just you know you you really come to learn that um we're all just people yeah but you know it's funny you mentioned an indian wedding um my wife has a, a friend from work and and he's from india and he's getting married and they actually asked me to perform the ceremony for him and to see everybody in the traditional garb and all that and his wife just Oh, it's, it's absolutely beautiful. His wife was Hispanic, but she was dressed in the garb and it was a magical day. I will not lie. It was awesome. Yeah. I mean, when we, we went there, the, the, they had the elephants. It was a, a very, very wealthy family. Uh, that was my wife's boss at the time. His daughter was getting married and it was, uh, it was quite a spectacle. It's a very big event in India and it goes on for days. So, um, yeah, I don't think they could get the permit for the elephant in Austin. So, <laughs> oh, yeah. then there's probably not a lot of elephants in Austin. <laughs> uh, probably not. But the, is there that one place that you want to go to you haven't gone to yet? Oh, there's too many to mention. I, I mean, uh, now, my favorite place that I've been to so far uh, is probably uh, Thailand because you can be in a beautiful city like Bangkok and visit the, the temples, which are magnificent. It's called the Venice of the East because there are so many canals. And um, hop on a plane and be in Chiang Mai or Chiang Rai in the middle of the mountains um, and um, really enjoy that. And then you know, get on a plane and be in, in, in Phuket um, on, a, on the most beautiful beaches you've ever seen. And the people are friendly, really friendly. And the food, if you like spicy food, it's the best. Uh, 
I love so, spicy food. I'd like to go back. We had a friend at church and she was from the Philippines. And mind you, I was married to an Hispanic woman for 20 years. So I was eating jalapenos and all that stuff all the time. And she said, oh, you want me to cook for you? I'm like, yeah, sure. You know, she says, you like spicy? I said, I love spicy food. Man, that was a big mistake. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd had hot food before. The older you get, the, the, you got to lay off of it a little more. You know? Well, it's a, it's a wonder I don't have a giant hole in my stomach as hot as that was. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to ask you one more question, and, and I'll let you go. But when you finally depart from this earth, what is the, the legacy that you want to be known for that you leave behind? Oh, I'd like to be known as a... Um, as a person who uh, really loved my God and my country and who was a good husband and father and who did the best he could and um, who helped as many people as he could. That's, that's awesome because I, I love the fact that you're not afraid to come out and say that you love God and you love your country. And I, I just wish that that sentiment would uh, would go out more often. Yeah, you know, I tell this to people all the time. I don't know if they believe it or not, but I don't have any fear of death whatsoever. Yeah. And that's not, I've, I've not always been that way. But I've just, you know, there's a song on my album about a near-death experience I have. And I just, ever since that day, 15 years ago, I just don't, uh, I don't fear it at all. Because I know God's waiting for me. You know, I, I, was, I said I was only going to ask you one more question, but do you, can you talk about your near-death experience? Sure, I can. I fell off the wagon and I aspirated. I wound up in the hospital, and I was uh, the odds were stacked against me, totally. I mean, my organs were shutting down, and nobody thought I had a chance. And there was a prayer chain that was set up. Excuse me. That's all right. Take a moment, man. It was a prayer chain set up, and. Uh, I came out completely fine, nothing wrong, um, you know, after being in a coma for three days. So that's why I started my charity and why I want to give what I have left. I don't want to leave anything, anything on the table. Power prayer, man. Power prayer. That's the first interview got me to tear up. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, usually they do that when they know they have to talk to me. So, <laughs> oh, I appreciate that, man. I really I enjoy talking. I'm going to pick you up on that barbecue when we, when we tour Texas. Well, we'll definitely exchange information then because uh, you're you're very welcome here. Thank you so much. Well, I appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. Thank you for opening up to us. That that means a lot. I never told that story to any other interviews, so there you go. Wow. Well, it's much appreciated. I think people need to hear things like that. Thank you. Honestly. Well, anyway, as I said, thank you. I want to thank everybody that watches our, our show or listens to it on the podcast. Without your support, we wouldn't be here. So until the next one. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. Please like, comment, share, and subscribe because it's only through your support that we're able to continue doing the things that we do. And until the next one, have a great, great day.